Min Xin touches on an interesting point. How should members of Congress deal with the NPC? Because it is not equivalent in power to our Congress. On the other hand, if they don't engage with it, is that going to help or hinder a process of development of institutions, which eventually will have to happen, that will improve governance in China under a system that can no longer be totally dominated by the single Chinese Communist Party. And already power is distributed in China in ways that would have boggled the mind 25 years ago. And the reason is because wealth is distributed around China now in ways that were totally different from 25 years ago when the central government allocated funds to everybody in the country, including all of the provinces. When a province can earn most of its income itself and struggle with the central government over how much it pays in taxes, you have a very significant change in the way that power is distributed within the PRC. And these are the types of trends that ultimately can lead to political change down the road. We're not there yet. We won't be there for some time. But there's no reason to think that as a country gets wealthier and as the wealth is generated in different parts of the country, you are not going to have shifts in the way that the political system is forced to operate and the National People's Congress will be part of that process of change. And the question is, does engagement help or hinder that process? I think it would help. But there has to be forbearance. You're not talking to people who wield the equivalent influence that you have as a member of Congress in this country. Other questions? I have a question. Uh, we, we haven't really touched on it, but although we, we, we both, both our speakers have, have actually touched on the, on the issue of domestic issues and domestic uh, uh, concerns, you can scarcely pick up the newspaper today, the Washington Post and the New York Times, and, and, and there's a story about uh, yet another uh, agrarian riot or uh, social disturbance caused by concerns that uh, the farmers have felt the un unjustly treated either because of land seizures or because of location of of, of uh, manufacturing plants that are considered to be uh, uh, polluting. Uh, what uh, I, I want to ask our, 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 our panelists uh, to comment on what, how big a threat is this to the internal social stability of China and what do you see in terms of long-term prospects for addressing this situation? Uh, I think each of us will have some comments. I think they'll probably be, be in China, the area where you cannot protest is over the political system. But on issues of social justice, on issues of unfair treatment by a factory, on issues of wages, protests occur all over China, including right in Beijing under your nose. I have gone to call on a minister in China and I've had to wend my way through a street filled with protesters in front of the ministry and had been accompanied out by senior officials and we wend our way through the protesters. So protest in China is every day in terms of the issues that are permitted to be protested. And that does not include a single party political system. Now the other thing is everything we know about protests in China we learn from the official media. When we talk about 80,000 protests taking place in China last year as opposed to 56,000 the previous year, that's all coming from reports that were carried in the Chinese media. Why are they carried in the Chinese media? Well, at least one of the reasons is China has a problem of injustice, which requires the shift of resources from the wealthy provinces in the coast to the poorer provinces in the interior. And yet all of the political leaders of the wealthy coastal provinces are heavily represented in China's top political institutions. So I see the reporting of protests in China partly as a method of warning the political leadership that you've got to approve the government's policies of resource transfer or else China is going to become increasingly unstable. 
Do the levels of protest suggest that China is on the verge of serious domestic instability? I don't think so. But the issues of social injustice in China are serious ones. And they are definitely getting the attention of the government, and that's reflected in the focus of attention at the current National People's Congress. Uh, the protests themselves are not going to threaten political stability. But the underlying issues that cause protest are going to threaten China's long-term development. Uh, that's because those protests are relatively small in size, uh, even though they are frequent. Remember, China is a huge country. I've calculated uh, uh, it's like uh, uh, 200 a day, but China has 2,000 counties. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and uh, also, it's very uh, difficult to organize protests across county boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Not a single protest has crossed county boundaries, which means they're very easy to contain. And then protests are uh, organized or are initiated uh, uh, by so-called uh, politically disadvantaged groups. So yeah. they lack the skill, the mobilization capability. So the, the, pro the, uh, uh, the number is high, but the effects are relatively minor. That, that's why the protests themselves are not good. But then if, if you look at why they are protesting, then you yeah. have, have to get very worried. It's over forcible seizure of land, about half of the protests than polluting factories in their neighborhood, about abusive government officials. I mean, these things, uh, we, we all know, are going to have some effect on China's long-term prospects. I think we're ready, we're ready, ready to wrap up our discussion. I would ask Ambassador Roy Min Chen if you have any parting thoughts for our, our audience today uh, based upon uh, the questions and comments. Uh, you've heard. So I'll just give you the open mic to uh, wrap up. Congress and members of Congress played a very important role in the opening up to China. Uh, the initial delegations to China were members of Congress. My first visits back to China when China began to open up were as a State Department escort officer for congressional delegations going there. This is back in 75, 76, and 78. I don't think that the role of China, of Congress in managing our relationship with China has changed at all. It's still a very important one. There are many things from legislation to resolutions to attention that are important in trying to move our relationship with China in ways that will benefit our national interest. And so I encourage Congress and members of Congress and staffers to members of Congress to do what they're doing, which is pay serious attention to understanding better our relationship with China and the ways in which China is changing for better and for worse. There are aspects which we should be very pleased by and there are aspects that should properly be of concern to us. Uh, I want to conclude by saying that today we are in this room, Mansfield room, and uh, Senator Mansfield was a leader in championing uh, U.S. interest in Asia and particularly the opening to China. And the U.S. Congress uh, has had terrific leaders on uh, the China policy. Uh, what I'm concerned is that uh, there needs to be fresh blood. Uh, and you look at the second tier uh, freshmen or the uh, relatively junior members of Congress, you do not find uh, dynamic leaders uh, and, uh, taking over the helm of the China policy. That's why I applaud Congressman Kirk, Rick Lawson uh, for organizing the China caucus. But we need, uh, need really to see a new group of leaders because uh, they will have a disproportionate role to play in the 10 years ahead of us. And on that note, I want to ask the audience to join me in thanking uh, both uh, Ambassador White, Mitch, and Faye. Thank you. <laughs>